choice to either bow down and blend in or stand up and stand out. And so it's been an amazing series and uh, really excited for the upcoming series that will begin next weekend. I, I pray that you can join us. But you know, a really crazy thing happened this past week. Oh, let's do this. By show of hands, did anyone here receive a suspicious email from me this past week? One, two, three, anybody else? Okay, there were a number of people last night as well. There is a fake Mark Palumpo who is trying to impersonate me and scam people in the church. It's awful. People have been contacting me throughout the week like, hey, Pastor Mark, sorry, but was this you reaching out to me? I was like, no, 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 that's not me. And it was awful. This imposter was like asking people to contact them. You didn't contact them, did you? Okay, good, right? Nobody, nobody contacted them, right? You guys knew that wasn't me, right? Okay, so really, really frustrating. I just want to go on the record and say, if you get contacted by a Mark Palumpo this week, don't respond. In fact, just report them, you know, and block them. But it's not me. And I was really frustrated about this. You know, I was thinking about it. I took it to the Lord. I was like, God, are you, you know, trying to speak through this? Why is this happening? A couple takeaways I got. The first that stood out to me was that several of the people who reached out to me said, hey, Pastor Mark, I got this from someone who said they were you, but it didn't sound like you. And so I'm just checking to make sure. And I thought the first thing the Lord, I felt impressed upon me was how important it is to be familiar with his voice. Amen. Amen. Jesus says the sheep know the shepherd's voice. And that's so important because the Bible says in the times we live in, there's going to be all these other voices that are going to be trying to guide you, trying to lead you, trying to direct you. And let me tell you something. Not all those voices will sound all that bad. In fact, some of them may sound pretty good, may even be packaged as a word from the Lord, but how do we tell the counterfeit from the real thing? We familiarize ourselves with the truth, amen? We familiarize ourselves with God's word. We learn how the shepherd sounds so that when all these counterfeit voices come our way, we can quickly identify them and say, you know what? Something's not right there. It looks Right, it says, has the name on it, but that's not how the Lord sounds, right? That was the first thing. And so that's why in this series, we began by really laying a foundation on the bedrock of truth. And we're talking about God's truth that does not bend, it does not change, it is not, you know, um, you know suspect to cultural opinion or the times. It is rooted in God's word, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It never changes. It stays the same. And so we have to begin with truth, and we have to stand on truth. And the second thing that I felt the Lord impress on me was actually I was getting really frustrated you know, first of all, that someone was doing this, you know, it's just a distraction. But then people started actually sending me the emails they were getting, and I started getting upset. I don't know which ones you got. Some of them said, hey, just contact me. Other people said that the email they got said, hey, this is Pastor Mark. I, I'm busy right now. I can't talk. But I promised a cancer patient that I would get them gift cards for their birthday, so I can't do it right now, but if you're near an Apple store, would you go run and get some Apple gift cards, and I'll reimburse you later. I'm like, man, this guy is, like, impersonating me and trying to scam people. And honestly, I was getting frustrated that I was being misrepresented. You know, this person's using my identity, but they're misrepresenting me. I would never, you know, ask people. I would go get the gift cards myself. I wouldn't make you guys do it, you know. And, and then the second thing the Lord impressed on me was... I wonder how often God has to deal with this. When people invoke his name, people use his name, people bear his name, but they misrepresent his character. And I thought, man, God must get so frustrated when people come in his name, but they totally misrepresent who he is. And that's why, again, as we went through this series, we talked about, okay, if we carry God's name, if we stand for truth, how should we conduct ourselves in a way that accurately represents him. And so we talked about this radical love, right? This love that Jesus demonstrates. And it's not a love that waits to be deserved. It's not a love that needs to be earned. In fact, it's a love that's given freely and graciously to, to all people, 
right? Regardless of whether they agree with us, regardless of whether or not they like us, regardless of whether or not they live like us, Jesus just gave this love to everybody. And this is a love that stands out from the love of the world. Because human love is, I love you if you love me. Or I love you if I think I'm going to get something in return, but the love of God is just freely given. It is a totally standout kind of love from the rest of the world. And another way we talked about standing out is in, in this area of holiness and purity. This is another way that we don't misrepresent God, right? We talked about relationships. We talked about what the Bible says even about sexuality and purity and how we're living in a world that is all about just self-gratification, self-indulgence, blurring the moral boundaries, but how God asks us to stand up and stand out in our relationships, not just out of a legalistic sense, but because we don't want to misrepresent God's character, his holiness, and who he is. And so if that wasn't enough, another area we talked about standing out was in the area of biblical stewardship. If you really want to stand out today, you're going to live radically different from the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world is living for the here and now, living for the temporary. But Christians are called to live for the eternal. We know that this life is not all there is. We're living from a kingdom perspective. And so a standout person is someone who sees their time, their treasure, their talent as something that has been entrusted to them, loaned to them to be used, not just for comfort, not just for personal gain, not just for gratification, but for the advancement of God's kingdom. And if you live with that perspective, you will stand out from the vast majority of people today. And then just last week, Pastor Lori gave a message about God's justice and how most people try to define justice, try to conform justice into our liking, into our image. And a lot of times what ends up happening is our justice really just looks more like revenge and getting even, right? And so we have to trust in God's justice, in what he says in his word. And as we take a look at all these weeks, you know, throughout this series, we're starting to see a picture of a person who stands up and stands out. And what we realize is that these things are not isolated events, right? To stand for truth, to love radically, to live holy, to steward wisely, to love, to act justly, right? These things are not isolated events, what we're getting is a picture of the life of a disciple of Jesus. It's a pretty radical life. As you can see, if you really took this seriously and lived this way, you would really stand out from the rest of the world. When we look at Jesus' followers, they stood out from the people around them because they were living this way. And you know, this past week, as I was as I was reflecting on this entire series and all the messages we've gone through and all these different topics, and really, it began to form like a composite sketch of a follower of Jesus. I'll be honest with you, I was sitting in the car and I was starting to feel pretty overwhelmed, actually. I was like, wow, this is radical stuff. If you take this seriously, if you, if you really do this, man, this is, this is crazy, and so much so, I, I began to feel overwhelmed. And I began to feel in my spirit. I confess to the Lord, God, I don't think I'm going to be able to live this way as long as I live. I don't know how many of you hear this and think, man, that's a, that's a tall order. I don't know if we're going to be able to live this way. And I just confessed to the Lord. I said, God, I don't know if I'm going to be able to live this way as long as I live. And I, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. And it actually surprised me what he said. He said, you're absolutely right. You're not going to be able to follow me. You're not going to be able to be my disciple. You're not going to be able to stand up and stand out as long as you live, which is why I'm asking you to die. And this is the thing that nobody seems to be talking about in church anymore. This is the real elephant in the room. This is the thing that Jesus talked about, but I don't hear very often these days, is that you and I will not be able to follow Jesus we won't be able to stand up and stand out as long as we live. As long as we live for ourselves. As long as we live for our comfort. As long as we live for our preferences. As long as we live for our plans and our agendas and our dreams. As long as we live, we won't be able to truly stand, stand up and stand out for God. We won't truly be able to follow him, which is why Jesus says, if you really want to follow me, you have to die. 
You have to die. And we shared this verse earlier, but I want to highlight it again. This is Jesus' invitation to all who would follow him. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, that's an instrument of death, and follow me. For whoever would save his life, whoever tries to hold on to this life, whoever tries to preserve their life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Jesus is making it very clear here that if we want to follow him, if we want to live for him, if we want to stand up and stand out for him, it will require for us to completely lay down our lives, deny ourselves. But you notice in this passage, there's a promise. The promise is if you lose your life, you will find it. In other words, if you choose to sacrifice your comfort, your plans, your agenda, and say, Lord, I want to do it your way. Jesus says, when you lay down your life in that way, you find true life. So there's a promise that Jesus makes to every single one of us, and that is that we will find true life. And I think that's why we're all here today, because of the promise of true life, right? That's the promise. But here's some, you know, Bible reading uh, advice. Anytime you come across a promise in the Word of God, it's usually preceded by a premise. So there's a promise, but there's a premise. We all want the promise of new life, but the premise, Jesus says, is first you got to get rid of the old one. See, we all want the promise of new life, but many of us are still very much alive to the old one. We want the promise of new life, but we haven't died to the old one. We want the promise of new life, but we don't really want to have to choose. We want to just kind of stay neutral. We want to sit on the fence, so to speak. You know, I often tell the story of the atheist who gave his life to Christ after a dream that he had. And as soon as the atheist woke up from this dream, he immediately made a choice and he gave his life to Jesus. Because in the dream, he says, I was standing in this large group of people. There's just like a whole crowd of people. And off to one side of the group was Jesus. And off to the other side of the group was the devil. And in the middle, running through the middle of the group was a fence. And with the scene set, the man said, all of a sudden, Jesus and the devil, they began to call out to people in the group. And one by one, people began to take sides. They, you know, a few people started going over to Jesus' side, but he noticed really the vast majority was going with the devil. But after some time went on, everybody had made their choice and everybody had sided with either Jesus or the devil. And after everyone had chosen, Jesus gathered, you know, sort of the, the group of people that was with him, and they went off, and they disappeared off to one side. And he said the same thing with the devil. The devil gathered the large crowd of people who chose him, and they went off to one side. He said, I was the only one left, and I was sitting on the fence all alone. And he said, I was sitting there all by myself. Everybody else had gone out of sight when all of a sudden the devil reappeared. He came back. And he sort of had this expression like he was looking for something. And so I called out to him. I said, did you lose something? And he said, the devil looked straight at me. And he said, no, there you are. Come with me. And the man said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I chose neither you nor him. I sat on the fence. And the devil said, that's okay. You see, I own the fence. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. There is no neutral. We have to make a choice. And listen very carefully, church. To not choose is to choose. Because to remain on the fence is to choose to live for this world. To choose to bow down and blend in. The devil owns the fence. There is no neutral. We have to make a choice to choose to reject this world and the life that it promises in order to take hold of God's kingdom and the life that he promises. And we see this all throughout scripture, that everyone who truly lived for God, everyone who stood up and stand, and, uh, you know, stand, up and stand out, every follower who did that for God, 
they had to make a choice. They had to choose to deny themselves. They had to choose difficult things in order to live for God. And Jesus talks about this very clearly in John chapter 12, verse 24 through 25. Jesus says to all of us, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, like a seed, picture a seed, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. It's just a seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. This, by the way, is the picture of baptism. In baptism, we are dying to ourselves. We're being buried with Christ, just like that seed But when we do that, when we lose our life, when we die with Christ, he promises that we bear much fruit. However, he goes on to say, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So again, Jesus is saying again that the only way that we can really stand up and stand out for him The only way that we can really have any impact in this world, the only way that we can really bring change, the only way that transformation happens is there's got to be a dying first. We can't hold on to our old life and take hold of the new one. Jesus says a choice has to be made. And I want to be real with you guys because, again, this is the scary truth that I don't hear anybody talking about anymore. We talk a lot about transformation. We talk a lot about revival. But I think the temptation is to think, well, you know what? I could reach my school if God had made me a more gifted individual. Or I could reach my workplace if I just had more understanding. Or if I was a better speaker. Or if I was more eloquent. Or if I could do this or that. And listen, there's nothing wrong with gifts. There's nothing wrong with understanding. But what if... Transformation really comes when we simply just die to ourselves, deny ourselves, live radically for Jesus, and do whatever it takes to see the world one for him. What if we saw a generation of believers who said, you know what? Yeah, you know, I've got a reputation, but I'm willing to just stand for the truth, even when it's not easy, even when it's not popular. Because I know that if I stand for Jesus, one day he's going to stand for me. And I don't care what the world thinks. What if we saw a generation of believers who said, you know what? I'm going to love this group of people, even though the world rejects them, even though my friends say, no, 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 don't, you know, people are going to think you're crazy if you do that. I'm going to love the unlovables because that's who Jesus loved. And that's who Jesus died for. What if we saw a generation of people say, you know what? I know this life is but a vapor. And so I'm just going to take whatever's in my hand and I'm just going to give radically because I know that this life is short and I'm living for the kingdom to come. What if we saw a generation of believers that said, you know, I'm just going to deny myself, die to the pleasures and temptations of this world. I'm going to live holy. I'm going to live set apart. I'm going to be pure for Jesus because I am dead to the things of this world, right? I'm going to live justly. I believe this is how transformation really comes. It's not through like an extraordinary, super talented, gifted group of people. It's just a group of people who have completely died to themselves and are completely living radically for the kingdom. I forget who said this, but one one, uh, theologian once said that if you want to see revival, revival is setting yourself on fire so that the world can watch you burn. It's just completely living on fire for God radically and the world coming to watch you burn for him. And we see this in scripture, actually. You know, we've been in these stories about the exiles living in Babylon, living in, you know, Persia and all this stuff. And you notice a pattern in these stories is that every time a breakthrough happened, every time the king's heart was changed, every time a new law was passed, every time deliverance came for God's people, it always came right after a moment where someone stood up and stood out for God. A moment where someone laid down their life and denied themselves, right? So right after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel were promoted, right? Big breakthrough in Babylon. What happened right before that? 
they stood up and they stood out and they said, we're not going to eat the king's food. We're going we're to keep ourselves pure, right? They denied themselves. Boom, God shows up and they are now elevated, right? Then they're being tempted to bow down before this huge idol, right? And everyone's bowing down and, you know, they stand up, stand out. They're thrown into the furnace and after they're delivered, what happens? The king passes a law throughout the whole land. Like transformation is coming to the kingdom of Babylon. But what did it take? It took people denying themselves. Same with Esther. When her people were delivered, what did it take? It, t- it took her laying down her life, dying to her reputation, dying to the crown, dying to her comfort, and saying, if this is what it takes, then I'm willing to pay the price. So you see, every time transformation happened, every time deliverance came, every time a person's heart was changed, why do I share this? Because we're all contending for spheres of influence, whether it's your home, whether it's your neighborhood, whether it's your school or your workplace. And again, the temptation is to think, man, if only I was just more gifted, then I could probably win my friends for Jesus. But what we see is that real change comes when we're willing to die to ourselves, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and live for God. How many of us know the story would have been very, very different if these brave men and women had not done what they did? If they had clung to their lives, if they had clung to their their comforts, we would have seen a very different story unfold. But they didn't. They died to themselves. So this is the mindset we need to have. And uh, there's an author that I talked about earlier who wrote this book, Discovering Daniel. His name is Amir Sarfati. And he, he talks about this. And in the story, right, this is really the, the main picture where we get stand up and stand out. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're the only ones in all the kingdom who are not bowing down to the idol. Literally, the rest of the world is bowing down in worship to this big golden statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are standing there. And each of us are going to have this moment in our lives. It may not be, you know, thrown into the fiery furnace, But each of us is going to have a moment where we'll have to make a decision. Do I bow down and blend in or do I stand up and stand out? And I want us to take a couple things from their example. First, notice what happens. The king sees these guys standing. Because how many of us know when you stand up and stand out, you stand out. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so especially in local culture, we really don't want to stand out. We, we just want to go under the radar. We don't, you know, don't look at me. You know, I just, I don't want to stand out, right? I don't want to be different. I don't want to make waves, right? But as a, as a Christian, you're going to have to go against the grain. You're going to have to go against the flow. And look what happens is these guys are not bowing down. And so they stand out. Can you imagine a whole football field full of people bowing down? Even if you're in the top row, you'll be able to tell, hey, these three guys, they're still standing. So the king goes up to them. And he's like, if you guys don't bow down this time, then I will have no choice but to throw you in the fire. And look what they said. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Now, I don't know about you, but I suspect that that was probably the first time in King Nebuchadnezzar's life where he ever heard that. He is used to getting his way. He is used to people bowing before him. He is used to people saying, yes, sir, yes, your majesty, whatever you say, we'll do whatever you say. And these three guys have the audacity to look the king in the eyes and say, quite frankly, your majesty, we acknowledge that you're a king, but there's someone else that we answer to, the king of kings. As we sang, there's a name Above all names. And so it doesn't matter if it's your boss. It doesn't matter if it's the professor in your university class. It doesn't matter if it's this influential client who wants to have their way. Listen, every single one of us has to answer to a higher power. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, you know, uh, you may be king. But we don't have to defend ourselves before you. It's not your favor we're seeking. It's God's. 
And then they go on to say something else. They say, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And here's the part that blew me away. And they said, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Not only can he, but he will. And then it takes a little turn here in verse 18. And they say, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And you know, if we read that at face value, it can be easy to think, oh, that's a cop-out. You know, yeah, yeah, you said you believe that God could save you, but look, now, you, now you're backpedaling. Now you're saying, yeah, yeah, he will, but, but he might not, and if he doesn't, that's okay too. It sounds like a cop-out. And as Christians, we don't like to pray that way. We don't like to pray even if he does not prayers because we think, oh, that means I don't have faith. That means I'm doubting, right? Because, you know, in James chapter 1, verse 6, it talks about asking God for things. And it says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And James says, if you doubt like that, if you ask like that, with any doubt in your heart, you're not going to get what you ask for. So we say, okay, I, I don't want to doubt. So I don't want to say that God might not do it. But in his book, Discovering Daniel, the author says, to pray, but even if he does not, is not a statement of doubt. Actually, if you think about it, it is a statement of ultimate faith and ultimate trust. Because not only are you saying, my God is able to deliver me from this, you're also saying, and also, I trust in his sovereign plan. Right? He is able to save me from this, and also... At the end of the day, this, this is the crazy part. They say, Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able to save us, and he will. But ultimately, if our deaths serve his purpose greater, we're fine with that too. Wow. That's heavy. How many of us would be willing to pray that, right? God, I believe you can deliver me from this circumstance, but also... If your answer is no, if your answer is wait, if your answer is different than what I want it to be, I'm fine with that too. Esther prayed a similar prayer. She believed that God could deliver her from the king's hand. She said, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. In other words, I'm about to go see the king, and to do so means I could lose my life. So let's pray because we know that the God that we serve is able to save us. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it's against the law. And here it is. And if I perish, I perish. There it is. She says, I believe. Let's pray and let's believe that God can do it and... If I die, I die. Wow. How many of us know Jesus himself prayed in even if he does not prayer? Right before he went to the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said to God, Father, if you are willing, not if you're able. He knew that God was able. He did not doubt that God was able. He believed that God could save him. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. So you see, to pray this way is not to doubt. We don't doubt that God can save us. We don't doubt that he will save us. But we also trust in his sovereign plan. We also trust in his timing. And you and I will face so many opportunities in life. So many crossroads, so many choices where will we bow down and blend in or will we do the hard thing and stand out, right? Maybe it could be in the workplace. Earlier in the series, we had that testimony from Jonathan and Sarah Lauren. They own a business. They have their own business. And one of their work vans was set on fire, completely destroyed. I mean, you talk about the whole business is, you know, affected now. And when they filed the insurance claim, they had a stand-up, stand-out moment. They had a choice. 
Do they lie about the insurance claim and collect all the money that, to replace the, the van that was destroyed? Or do they tell the truth and probably get basically nothing, right? So they have to make a choice. They have to pray, God, we know that you can provide in this matter. But even if you do not, we're not going to lie. We're not going to lose our integrity. We're going to stand. And they did. And they they didn't get the money the way they thought they would, but then God supernaturally provided through the church and through other believers. You know, maybe it will be in the area of finances. You know, you know that God is asking you to steward well what he has entrusted to you. He's asking you to be obedient, to test him with your finances. He's asking you to be obedient in giving to certain things. And you're looking at it and you're looking at on paper, it doesn't seem to make, make much sense. Can we have the faith to pray, God, I'm going to obey you in this? And even if the provision doesn't come in the way that I think it will, even if it doesn't seem to make sense on paper, yet will I trust you. Yet will I trust that you will provide for me and you will meet all of my needs. Another is in the area of relationships. God may ask us to do bold things in the area of relationships. Maybe you're in a relationship right now and you know, and I'm not talking about marriage I'm talking about a relationship where you know this relationship is not leading you closer to Jesus. It's taking you further away from him. And you know that to obey means to make a difficult decision. And we say, God, I really want this to work. I'm going to obey you in this. But even if it does not, yet will I trust you. This is actually not in my notes, but as I was sharing that, I actually thought that that's exactly what happened with Jaylee and I. We, before we were married, you know, we were both in college. We both really liked each other, you know, and I thought the relationship was going well. And then all of a sudden, I just felt a check in my spirit that it wasn't God's timing. And I said, God, if we pause this now, she might go find someone else. I mean, I was looking in the mirror thinking she probably will find someone else. I mean, there's a lot better. She could do way better, you know, and she probably will, you know, I, and I said, okay, well, I had to pray, uh, and even if he does not prayer, right, and I have to put a pause to this, I really hope we end up back together, but even if we do not, I have to obey God in this. I remember that was one of the most difficult car rides of my life, where I had to explain to her, you know, everything's going great, I think we really like each other, but I just don't know that this is God's timing, and, I, and this is no strings attached. I don't know when God is going to give us a green light. I'm not saying to wait for me. I'm just saying, I don't think this is God's timing. And the amazing thing was, it was like a dying. It felt like a death, like a dying to self in that moment, a dying to what I wanted. And I'll never forget her response. And this is really when I knew that she was the one. She said, you know, that you would do that. It actually makes me respect you even more because I know that you're willing to listen to God even above yourself. And that thing that I thought was going to destroy the relationship actually strengthened it. And when God brought us back together, it was built on that foundation. And I praise God for that. He knows better than we do. You will face choices, job opportunities, you might be in a hostile work environment. You might have a group of friends, and you know, man, if I really stand for what the Bible says, they may never speak to me again. They may, they may isolate me. They may reject me. Are we willing to pray, God, I pray that you would change their hearts to not reject me, but even if you do not, I'm not going to blend in just to, you know, compromise my values. You see how there are so many real-life applications for this. We will face these decisions from time to time in our everyday lives. The question is, whose favor do we desire most, God's or man's? Daniel knew the times he was living in. Daniel saw the writing on the wall, literally, because in Daniel chapter 5, He's no longer a young teenager who's just been sent off to Babylon. He's no longer under King Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 5, when we catch up to him, he's towards the end of his life. He's an old man now. 
Um, he's much wiser, much more mature. He's lived through the whole Nebuchadnezzar administration, and now there's a new king on the throne, King Belshazzar, a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. And King Belshazzar is wicked, man. He, he throws this banquet, you know, for all of his nobles. And he says, oh, you know what this party needs? Hey, let's bring in those cups that my, you know, that King Nebuchadnezzar stole from God's temple in Jerusalem. Let's get those in there because I want to raise a toast to my gods, pagan idols. So they bring in these sacred cups, you know, and they're drinking out of them. They're toasting to their pagan gods. And you got to read this story. I had people come up to me after church last night and say, I had no idea that story was in the Bible because it's crazy. But in the middle of this party, everyone's partying, everyone's drinking and stuff. The Bible says all of a sudden this like hand appeared. Do you guys know this story? Like a dismembered hand appears. Go read it. Daniel chapter 5. You know, I know this is October. It's kind of like spooky season. Imagine that, right? Like a dismembered hand appears and just begins writing on the wall. This is where we get the phrase, the writing is on the wall, by the way. It's from this story. So this dismembered hand appears just starts writing on the wall. Talk about a total buzzkill. I mean, like, the party's over at this point. I just picture the DJ just like, you know, it's like the music stops. You hear, like, a glass shatter, you know. And everyone's just staring at this hand. And the Bible literally says the king's face went pale. All the color drained from his face. His, knee, his legs went weak, and his knees started knocking, the Bible says. I didn't know that happened in real life. Like, I only saw that in, in the cartoons, you know, or it's just like, you know. That's literally what happened to this guy. His knees are knocking. And, I mean, how many of us would probably feel the same way if right now we just saw a dismembered hand just start, like, writing a message on the wall? And so just like Nebuchadnezzar, he does the same thing. He's like, okay, bring in all the wise men, the astrologers, the enchanters, right? That, that's what King Nebuchadnezzar would do. And he makes this declaration. He says, if anybody can read that writing on the wall, you're going to get a fine purple robe. I'm going to deck you out with a gold chain. And not only that, I'll promote you to the third highest position in all of the kingdom. So all these guys show up. They're all excited. But none of them can interpret the message, obviously. And so the queen is there. And she says, your majesty, there's this guy. <laughs> There's this guy that King Nebuchadnezzar used to bring around in moments like this. When nobody else could crack the code, they'd bring this guy in. His name is Daniel. And the wisdom of the gods lives in him. He's the guy you want. So he's like, all right, bring this Daniel guy in. So now Daniel shows up. And again, he's not a young man anymore. He's much older, much wiser. And the king's offer stands. The king says, hey, if you can read this message... Everything I promise is yours. Gold chain, purple robe, promotion to the third highest position. And look what Daniel says. After all these years, he still stands up and stands out. The Dan then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. The audacity of this guy. <laughs> Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. And... Again, Daniel has to deliver a very difficult message to the king. And he, in essence, he tells him, okay, so what the message means is your days are numbered because you have not humbled yourself before God. Your kingdom is at an end. And your days are numbered, your majesty. And, and it's over. <laughs> it's over for you. Now, Again, that must have been pretty scary to tell the king that. That's not the kind of message the king wants to hear. And yet that's exactly what Daniel told him. And he rejects the promotion. He rejects the king's gifts because he sees the writing on the wall. And this is really what I felt like the Lord wanted me to share with all of us today. Is that for a time, there are people in our world who have been given authority, like King Belshazzar. And they're not righteous. They're not good people, right? But they've been given authority to rule and to reign. They have influence. They have power. They can promote you. They can shower you with gifts. But listen, like Daniel, we have to know the times we live in. We have to see the writing on the wall. Because the Bible tells us at the end of this passage 
that that very night, King Belshazzar was slain in his sleep and the new king of Persia came in, Babylon fell, and a new kingdom was established. The word of the Lord came true that night, and Daniel saw the writing on the wall, and he was prepared. I'm sure the king and his whole administration was slaughtered, but Daniel lived on to live under this new king, King Darius, that came in. And could you imagine... Could you imagine that transition? Everything that God said came to pass, and Daniel, his life was spared. All that to say, church, that in these days that we're living in, there will be people of influence. There will be people in power. But listen, God's word says that their days are numbered. This kingdom, its days are numbered, and it will soon come to an end. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we want to receive all the praise, all the promotion, all the gifts of this world when we know that there's another kingdom coming soon? Daniel saw the writing on the wall. He knew the times he was living in. And in the same way, I pray that we would not be seduced by the gifts and promotions and power of this world. Because listen, when the new kingdom comes, those things will be of no use to us. None of those things mattered. That chain, that promotion, in a matter of moments, none of that was going to matter. But Daniel made the right choice, and he lived on to see the next kingdom. My question is, are we living for this passing kingdom, or do we have our eyes set on the kingdom to come? Amen? Let's bow our heads as we close in a word of prayer. And as we close this morning in reflection, I want to ask you some questions. And the first is, as you think about what Jesus says, that we will have to make a choice, that we will have to choose to stand up and stand out, but that that will require complete surrender and even a denying to ourselves. I want you to just examine your own heart and ask the Holy Spirit if there's any areas in your life where you feel like maybe you're still holding on to control instead of surrendering fully to God's will. Along with that, maybe there are areas where you feel like you're still sitting on the fence. You know that God is calling you to make a clear decision, a clear choice to not stay neutral, to not blend in, to stand for Him maybe in the area of relationships or at work or in your finances. And you have to ask yourself, am I willing to make the choice and get off the fence? And along those lines, we may have to pray. And even if he does not, prayer. How does the thought of praying that either challenge you or encourage you in your current circumstances? Are there any circumstances you find yourself in right now where you need to trust in God's sovereign plan, even in the midst of uncertainty, and pray, God, I know that you are able to deliver me from this, but even if it doesn't look the way I think it should, even if it does not happen as quickly as I think it should, even if your answer is no, I trust in your plan, and I know that you have a better one, so I will surrender to you. Lord, As we conclude our series this morning, I pray that we would wrestle with what it takes to stand up and stand out for you. That to truly see you move will require a dying to ourselves. I pray that you would give us the courage. I pray that you would give us the boldness because when we deny ourselves this life, you give us a better one. And so, Lord, I pray that in those moments we would see you move just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like Daniel, just like Esther, just like you, Jesus, who laid down your life so that true transformation could happen. I pray your blessing over every family, every home, every marriage, every young person here, God. Would you shield us? Would you guide us? Would you cover us and protect us in this season ahead? We thank you and praise you for all that you have spoken to us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen. Well, that concludes our series.
we're all wrestling with this together. But if you have any time, feel free to stick around, enjoy some food and some fellowship. Uh, we also have our prayer team standing by with a yellow lanyard. So if you came and you want prayer for anything, seek out one of our prayer team and they would love to pray for you. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you guys next weekend as we start a brand new series. Until then, have a great week and God bless. <laughs>